this is two hours already into our meeting. Um, so I'll take a motion to come out of executive session. So moved. Do we have a second? Second. second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So we've been in executive session, as I expect you all know. Um, we've been interviewing <coughs> candidates for office. We don't have much to report. Um, we interviewed for treasurer. Um, we don't have much more to say about that just yet. Um, we are going to have to back off a little bit on road foreman. Um, we find that we're unable to fill the position at this time. So we're going to um, regroup and think about how we're going to get that position um, taken care of in the future. Okay. Mm, or just we, uh, it's, it's complicated because we also need to get a new member for the winter. So we have to, we have to figure out how we're going to go th do it. And we'll decide how to move forward. That'll do. <laughs> Thanks, Rose. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, have you all had a chance to look at the minutes? We have got two sets of minutes, December 25th and December, September, mm -hmm. and September 26th. Everybody okay with the minutes? Mm -hmm. Would you move them? Uh, I'd move to accept the, uh, the two sets of minutes. Great. Do we have a second? Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Uh, board orders are coming around. Yep. Please try to sign them. Um, we uh, had a, this, a traffic study done. Um, as you know, we were going to try to do traffic studies on a lot of the roads because uh, we need to do them before we can change the speed limit. It has to be based on data. And um, the way it works is we, we count the speeds at which people are driving. This is state law. At which people tend to drive, we throw out the fastest 15%. So the speed at which the slowest 85% are driving is the speed limit, unless we have a really, really good reason for not driving at that limit. Um, so we had a counter put up, CVRCP put a counter up on County Road and measured the cars going and the average speed at 80, at the top speed at 85% was 51. So that would indicate that we cannot um, lower the speed limit to 40 as proposed. Okay. Uh, you can see this, we can, we can make these data available to you if you want. I just have a question about what their standards are because um, I mean, what you're saying is if, if people are not exceeding the existing speed limit by a lot, then they can't lower it. No, no. When you set the speed limit, it has to be based on data. Uh, the, uh, this is state law. And the assumption is, apparently, that most people drive at a safe, comfortable speed. So you throw out the top 15%, and then everybody that's driving at or below the next spe high, fastest speeder, that's the speed limit. You can round it, but that's the speed limit. Unless you, you know, if there's a hospital or something, obviously you can, you can um, <coughs> go more slowly. I wonder how these popular but there's they may not have done it based on data, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it sounds counterintuitive to me because, of course, if the speed limit's 50, people are going to drive 50. If the speed limit's 40, people will probably drive 40. And so the law doesn't make sense to me, but that is what the law says. Well, as, as, it, was, as it was presented to us, I, there's, it, there's a behavioral element of it too. And so having drivers that are driving, having a speed limit set that is, uh, that is significantly lower or even you know, marginally lower than what, uh, than what, than what people are already inherently, you know, basically voting with their, with their right foots. Um, you know, what, what the mass or the average uh, individual driving on the road considers to be safe. And if, they, and if a group of people are all doing that, then the slow traffic ends up being a, a safety hazard as well, because then people start acting uh, more recklessly to, uh, to get around the slower traffic. So um, there, 
there's a, there's a reason you look at the data first and there is accommodations in the law to, to make exceptions under, under extenuating circumstances when, when there are circumstances that would justify it, but, um, but, but that's why it's an important first step. Um, and that was the county road. So uh, there are other there are other roads that are still on that priority list um, that uh, uh, VLTC didn't uh, didn't get a chance to study. There's a hand up over there. I just have a quick question. Um, Could you identify yourself? Yeah, my name is Sage County um, My question is, what what dates were this study done? Because mm -hmm. I feel like the flooding and a lot of traffic. Um, I feel like there were, I just would like to know when the study was sure. done. What we didn't, we were scheduled to do it. Were. Yeah, we were scheduled to do it when the flooding was still an issue. So we put that off. Uh -huh. But then we decided, although we don't think we're quite ready to do it on the dirt roads yet, the gravel roads, we could do the paved road, the one paved Correct. road. So, so we did it. The road study that you have data yeah. on, what were the dates? Where they, I'm it? trying to tell you, they were okay. September 15th to. September 22nd, okay, and the counter was set up and they recorded every hour Great. how many had gone by and at what speed. Yep. And, you know, and, and the data is important and, and I think, you know, when, when we get down to it as a community, you know, it, the, the ones that stand out are the ones that are driving really fast and they're on there. You can see them and you can see when it was. And one of the conversations that we had with the Sheriff's Department um, was identifying the time frames when you have habitual offenders who are going and, and these, these are all these are personal habits you know and so you you can you can do targeted in, in enforcement um, and <laughs> from my perspective I think this really comes down to uh, an enforcement issue it, it doesn't matter what the speed limit's going to be if people if the vast majority of the population is going to drive a certain speed and a, and a certain portion of the population are always going to drive, drive incredibly fast, regardless of what that speed limit is, then, then that's not a speed limit issue, that's an enforcement issue. And we as a town need to have a conversation about what our budget is for wanting to address that enforcement issue. Um, and what a time to be talk, talking about that, because <laughs> that's do, what we're doing. Do people want to see these data? Because we can post them if they're of interest to people. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Yeah, Tina. The question was, uh, you know, you mentioned that there are ways to appeal based on various factors. Is the fact that it's in the middle of the road that the speed limit just changes at the town line? Like, I as a driver, that really annoys me, just on a personal level, when it's this and then it's that, and unless you've been driving regularly, you don't know. Is that a reason we could appeal or no? Uh, well, we don't appeal. We just state that that's our right. reason. I suspect that East Montpelier didn't base theirs on data. The trouble is if you don't base it on this kind of data, um, the, the law enforcement won't enforce it. That's basement. <laughs> so you could try that. <laughs> yeah. Anything else on that one? All right. Um, ben, you're here. Um, Knudsen curb cut application. The town, uh, Ben has um, submitted an application for a curb cut on Jack Hill Road, and the road crew has looked at it. Three of them went over, Tyler, John, and Dana. They said the site conditions um, are, are fine. Uh, they asked that a 15-inch culvert be installed um, and directed to the northeast side of Jack Hill and, um, and regularly maintained, regularly cleaned out. Um, they're going to dig a ditch along the road to, um, let me find, oh, to make the, um, the drainage go north. And just south of it, they're going to build a, um, call it like a little catch, a very small catchment basin. So it'll come out both ends of the culvert, apparently, some of it in the catchment basement, basin, and some of it will drain down to the other culvert that goes back across the road. And with those conditions, they recommend that it be approved. Stephanie. Um, I want to make a comment. Um, there were ditches dug along the east side of Jack Hill Road a few years ago. They were very, very deep. They were along the west ends, and I guess, I guess they went along. I don't remember if they went as far as yours. Well, they must have, because it's the same driveway. Um, they were very deep. And it, 
and it made driving there very scary at times, especially in the winter when you can't see. You know they're there, but you know the road is fairly narrow, um, and I'm concerned about if they continue the same thing, digging dick deep ditches as it goes up past bends then to this new um, curb cut, that we're going to have the same kind of situation. And I drive on that road almost every day. I live at the top of the hill, so I'm very familiar with it. Mm -hmm. And it was very, it, the, the it dishes was, were really dangerous. Did, did, in the winter time? Even though this, wouldn't the snow have been built up between the road and the ditch? The snow goes into, fills up the ditch and you don't know where it is. Uh -huh. You don't know where the ditch begins. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And it's a problem in a lot of roads when there's roads that are relatively narrow and deep ditches. That if you go in the ditch you are not going to drive out which co is con contradicts the road standards, which say that the road, the ditches should be no deeper than cars or vehicles are able to drive out if they accidentally drive in. Mm. And those ditches were just amazingly deep. And I don't know if they are now. I, mean, I don't think ditches are maintained very much. So maybe they're not, maybe they're filled in. I don't know. But I'm just saying that when they were first dug and for years afterwards, they were dangerously deep. And um, yeah, I, I just hope that these, when this ditch is dug, the road standards are followed, and the ditches are dug no deeper than would have to happen. Um, would ha would be you could drive out of it if you drove in accidentally or on purpose. But do you know anything about this? Um, they did they did the standards of the better roads. The local roads manual is that in the local roads manual that it's supposed to be only a certain amount deep. I think I that's. The road I one. think the road standards said that the ditches, the ones they used to say, I don't think they would change. The Callis Road standards. The road standards. Mm -hmm. that's right. the I think Vermont that's standards. a place yes. where Callis Road standards differ from the state, state standards. standards. I, I, so as long as they follow the ca the back road standards, you are satisfied? No, because they're often inconsistent. And my, I remember the last select board, the last, I believe the last time they approved these road standards, or, or recently, there was a caveat that if they, the state standards differ from the CALIS standards, the CALIS standards would supersede the right. state standards. But you'd be you you would be content if they were following the callous standards. Is that what I'm hearing? Yeah. Yes, okay. But the callous yeah. standards are very okay. shallow and That's won't fine. allow for the water to. Which is one of the issues with. Yeah. And if there's if there's a culvert. If there's a flooding yeah. event or I mean that water needs to be able to move and it. Great. It's a much larger conversation, but with the changing world, you know, the capacity for water to move in a timely manner where it's got to go um, so it sounds is like, important, it sounds and that's like why they ditch the way that they do. Part of the issue has to do with frost line and culverts, and if the culverts aren't deep enough to be below the frost line, they, they need to be replaced more often. They can be damaged with the freezing and thawing. And in order to have the culverts deep enough to be below that frost line, the ditches have to be deeper to accommodate them. And so that's why the state standards changed mm -hmm. to recommend the deeper ditching. The Callis standards still recommend the more shallow ditching, which I agree with you, feel safer, is safer, in terms of cars going into them and not getting stuck. But this is a this is a one of the many thorny callous state road standard differentials that has come up again and again and again over the years and I don't know what the answer is. It's well, a bigger it's, conversation. Yeah, it is a bigger conversation. <laughs> and it's not part of this curb cut permit, but we could um, make a note that at some point in the future we might want to visit revisit standards yeah. and have these conversations. I think there are, I remember, I mean, there were lots of conversations about this. And I think that people talked about there are ways of grading, maybe making it more gradual, so you don't have that sudden right. plunge. Um, and, you know, I would hope that. You can, you can make the roads wider to get that grade. Perhaps, perhaps we're maybe maybe in areas where there are 
the potential for deep culverts, there should be water road there. Oh yeah, I, I mean, I think we could probably uh, work language in there. Uh, considering that this driveway is going to require a, a, a culvert, and, it, and culverts need to be used to manage storm water, and that seems like a prudent measure. Um, that you know that that the culvert is installed uh, in the ditching adjacent to it um, is adequate to accommodate the installation of the um, the culvert, but any subsequent ditching or adjustment of ditch, uh, ditching, you know, further up the road, which is would fall into the town's purview, is is done in consideration of the Calus Road standards. Right. We wouldn't put that in Ben's permit, though. We could talk to the road crew about it. Yeah. And I would say in this situation also, the site distances may be adequate. I believe that they are. I believe that they are. But we are, there are curves. We are going around curves there. And so it's not like you have like long, one long flat thing. You can see far ahead. It's nice and wide. You're talking about curves and you're talking about failing narrow road. And it's, you know, I don't want to end up in that ditch. Yeah. Right here. Yeah. <laughs> we don't want you to. <laughs> so I'm trying to suggest maybe something can be done. Yeah, sounds like something we can talk to the road crew about. I, I don't think this is the applicant's issue. This is a town yeah. Yeah. road crew oh, issue. Sage has a... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I, you're, you're behind the post from my point of view. Yeah. Ben, do you have anything to say about this before I talk? I just wasn't sure if the applicant has anything to say about no, this No, he's issue. put in his application okay. and they've approved it, so... Or Who's approved it? Well, the road commissioner has approved right. it from okay. as far as I just wanted to say that the development review board has had an application twice from Ben. I don't know if you guys have known that. I don't know if you know any of this history. And if you don't, I want to put it on pause. And my request is you make no decision right now. And then. Wait, you did they not get their DRD permit? Or did he not? Oh, okay. God. Yeah. I thought it was contingent on you getting a curb cut. No, it was contingent on him getting the right of way, which is, is well, no, that was what he was getting. No, the, the, it wouldn't be contingent on that. Is the review, uh, this is I just want to say, so the development review board, okay, so, so they took on two different applying times, um, and it was for Dividing a 6.2 acre lot into 3.17 and 3.13, if we want to be technical, for a non road front, non frontage lot, right, to divide. And so I am not one to want to say anything about what anybody can do with their land. But so, okay, non frontage lot, not going to complain, but a curb cut on Jack Hill Road, almost anywhere, should have more assessment than just to sign off on it. And I hope that we will pause, delay, or deny this. Why are you smiling? We, we, can't, we can't reasonably deny yeah. somebody access to, uh, to their property from, from a town highway. And so- I thought it was, but I thought the development review board approved it as a, right of way as you said or a non road frontage so we're not denying anybody they, anything they, yet right they, and I, I am not intimately familiar with the conditions but there's a reason that it was likely in front of the drb is because uh the the creation of a non frontage road lot or a non frontage lot is a non-conformance that would require the approval of the drb so that being said, if the DRB approved the conditions uh, associated with creating that non-road frontage lot, okay. the aspect that we're considering tonight is the is the access to the to the property and <clears throat> and the safety of doing so relative to the standards set by the state. So we can't reasonably deny somebody access to their property. Um, if I it totally meets the exceptions. Agree. I just want to say the site, I feel, is extremely dangerous. My property is actually where the culvert would put out their water. 
I'm, 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 I have five culverts already on my property. And I'm not a my property thing. This is actually not our land, right? We're just hanging out with it and trying to take care of it. And this is a curb cut above, like, oh, like there's actually a curb in Jackal Road, and it's at Red Toller's old house. At that property, there's a curb. And those looks, do you agree with me, Stephanie? That's like a dangerous place to have any kind of something coming down. The last place that is safe is Chris Tilder's driveway. And I can't imagine there being a driveway in between that and north of the house on Jack Hill Road. Um, there's a gully right across from that spot. There's a gully, a huge gully that, that divides um, and goes down to Peekinbrook Road. Um, and the amount of road, uh, I don't know, the maintenance, the washouts, the culverts, um, and when you say widening the roads, down at the furthest end, they already have widened the road, but there's not a lot of road to widen on Jack Hill Road. And I really would like us to respect that. I, I, I don't feel like we can say what other people can do, that there's safety in the hall, there's, that's a bus route, that's a school bus route, um, that's a curve. There's, I mean, to add a culvert and somehow water's gonna go north, somehow on that driveway, I don't know where it will go. And so that's why I'm asking for a pause. I don't know, I guess I can't do that. Can, I'm well, very concerned. We can only, of course, look at it under the, what the ordinance gives us authority to look at it under, and Stephanie will correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's sight distances and culvert. Okay. I'm not the one you propose. I'm talking about the I existing. I did spend a lot of time on the curb cut, and I do not remember the language, the exact language right now. Oh, oh sorry. Right. If you can say it. Okay, that's but my understanding. It would involve this kind of stuff that Sage and I are raising. Yeah, I know. You know, and I, I, know. I mean, we're talking about other sides of the road. Of course, Stephanie's talking about the ditch aid, which is on the western side, and I get that too. There's lots of problems with that bottom part of Jack Road because it takes on all the water. Sage, can you just clarify for me what is it you'd like us to look at that hasn't been looked at? I just want you to not approve this right now. But, but for what reason? That's what I just want to understand. Because there's a lot of unknowns right now with this development of a curb cut. I mean, you look at what happened on George Road on that corner, and we're not saying, hold on, we respect your rights, but this but, looks... But how would it be different if we put it off for two weeks? The other ones looking at it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You might see something. I don't know if it's, the sight line is really there for safety of cars coming around that curve. Are you going to cut like, I don't know. Again, don't, it, do you guys know this curve? It, it needs, it about? needs, it needs to be that there's, there's room for discretion there. And so a, a, a right. property owner is going. I paying for this like. Curb cut. The town doesn't pay for the curb okay, cut. Okay, great. Part part of the point of having a part of the point of having a curb cut ordinance, um, and the one that we have, and many towns have, is that, you know, we we are, we are to take into consideration uh, the safety risks uh, and what plays into that are largely line of sight, um, and. Uh, and traffic frequencies, that, that sort of thing. But it's all, you know, relative to the site and the conditions of the site and the, uh, and, right. and what the other options are for the property owner uh, right. to work within the limitations of the property that they own. Okay. And so the second uh, element of that is to make sure that, you know, adequate measures are being taken to protect the, uh, the town infrastructure, um, which would be the road, and not you know putting in curb cuts or allowing curb cuts to be installed in a way that would adversely impact the the town infrastructure, uh, and that's largely where the culverts come into play. Right. You know, redirecting stormwater so that they don't scour the roads. Right, um, but also not adding another like thing that has to be, that is taking away from just the natural runoff of water, right? 
we just had a huge flood, and we have to think about how we work with how water runs off hills, right? That's a hill. Just that whole curb, curb cut is a hill coming down onto another hill and wash out. And then it goes to the good old Peak and Brook, and Peak and Brook took on everybody's water. I mean, so I don't know. I just want to think about, like, I get the road stuff, but there's also our brooks and streams and water runoff. And, and so Scott has something to say. Um, I, I want to say that I. I I totally support Ben's having a house there. I think it's a, I think we need more houses in Calus, and that's a pretty well sighted place. Um, there is already a curb cut on property that belongs to Ben. Um, it's the driveway for that first house. Um, it's, it's there, it's ready to go. Ben could access his property using that curb cut. Ben, why are you not using that to access your curb cut? It's the preference. Oh, it's, it's personal preference. It's not, oh, I thought the DRB had denied that site. That's no, wrong. He, there is a, he has a driveway, and initially he was going to use it to, and extend, yeah. extend the easement would then go, he'd start on that driveway, go past the house, and then continue onto the lot that he just created. OK, I'm confused. Didn't you have to go to the DRB to get that as a right-of-way? I got you got that as a right of way. As it is. But if you were to go back to the other curb cut, do you have a right of way there too? I do not. You'd be going across Weston's land, is that right? No. Oh, it's your own land. It's his own land. Oh, so you can give yourself a right of way. No, I would have to go through the DRB, no. which was no. uh, a process that I would, uh, in the process of for almost four months yeah. with multiple meetings. and. Uh, a lot of charged intent. So I'm not interested in, in having you go back through that process um, if anything can be helped. Well, to be fair, he initially, uh, he initially applied for the original one initially and then changed, changed it, withdrew it, and then came back with this different location that would require another mm -hmm. curb cut. The first one wouldn't require another curb cut. It would require an approval of extending the easement across his across the land that he's selling onto the land that he created. So, you know, I didn't I didn't sit on them. I sat on the issue. I, I actually sit, did. I didn't sign the <laughs> and as I recall, you withdrew because there was some problem with the neighbors. Just to be clear. Yeah. Um, all right, we're getting way off schedule here. Ben, how, how what's your timeline? Are you getting ready to build, or if we put it off and had some more discussion? I, I, I do not want to. This process has dragged me through so much money. I spent so much money on wires, and I will spend more. But I prefer not to. And I think that. No, I'm not asking you to spend more money. I'm, I'm asking if it could wait two weeks. No. Oh. I, I Can you tell me why that. not? Because the I, I need surety and. My, the attack that has come against me has been to delay and delay and delay and have these things that are not necessarily relevant, generally based on emotion and preference of people that are not, you know. No, but I understand, but would it, would it cost you more money to wait two weeks? It, it could. It could cost me a lot of money. Um, I prefer not to have to disclose it. I think that the guys, when they looked at it, there was concern about how the water would flow, and they did put a fair amount of thought, as you saw, into how they could mediate any water issues. Other thoughts? They, they were all very friendly, and they said, we're going to throw a, a stick in here, and then it will be fine. I mean, if they approved it and we started this meeting, yeah, but saying they, that it would be approved, I don't know. I appreciate people's concerns about things changing, but it's not a safety issue. Yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. a violation. It's, it's, it's or, adequate line of sight, and uh, and they've made a recommendation uh, in their best uh, in their best sense to have to mitigate stormwater issues and runoff issues relative to the road infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Then would that is like to make a that is adequate. So I would make a motion to accept the. Um, uh, 
to accept the application um, as, as presented and as uh, recommended uh, by the road crew um, with the understanding that, um, that the ditching be adequate to accommodate uh, the, uh, the proposed culvert, but no greater, um, and that every effort should be uh, made to uh, wait, wait, wait. Ditches. Rose, are you getting this? With the understanding about what? <laughs> uh, that, the, that the ditching associated with the culvert in installation is adequate to accommodate the culvert as proposed. But not exactly. Uh, but, but no more. So <clears throat> Rose actually has the wording that the road crew submitted. No, so that's that's her. This is a little different. I know, I know. So that's why I, I think she's just looking for the distinction between what the road crew recommended, the conditions, and why you guys would just say as recommended by the road crew with this addition. Have uh, you got that, Rose? You all set? Everybody understand the motion? Uh, do we have a second? Second. Everybody understand it? Are you ready to vote? Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 It's unanimous. Sorry, guys. Yeah. I think what you need to do is talk to the back roads committee and work on those standards. Yeah. Okay. Uh, grand list. The um, John, do you want to speak to this? There's not much to say at all. Honest mistakes. <laughs> the first one was probably the fault of Vermont Pie. It was a current use personal property and current use in both East Montpelier and Callis. The Callis portion was never given the current use exemption, so that's the first one. The second one was the listers weren't there, the owner wasn't there. We uh, took our best shot. We sent a change of appraisal notice to the owner, and even following our visit, told them that we'd been there, and we sent them the lister back. With that, everything was fine until we got his tax bill, and he said, holy cow, look at this. So we went up, and we found found things that we corrected and lowered it. And the last one was kind of strange. Um, the woman owns three pieces of property, letting properties. Two of them, are, they're, all, they're all camps. And the description was it was a building that was knocked down and rebuilt. So we went to where these three camps were, and we found a building that had clearly been rebuilt. So we assumed that that was the parcel that we were looking at. Um, we made a mistake. So we assigned all these changes to the wrong parcel. When we realized our mistake, we just we reversed things and put it back the way it was. So but it ended up with a net change of appraisal. The last two are the same name. I know. Oh, OK. That's what I'm saying. She's the same person. Same person. Yeah. Is this this Mary Thalman? Yes, it is. And then Elliot Jacob, and then Gary Lewis and Trevor Lewis? Am I uh, Gary that right? Lewis was the, the first one. That's the current use. Yeah. And then, and then uh, Jacob Elliot was the second one, and that was yeah. the looser error. And then Thalman is the last. Yeah. Thank you. Questions for uh, John? Will you, uh, somebody make a motion that we should sign this? Authorize it and sign it? It looks like uh, we all have to sign this one. So moved. Second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Aye. For what it's worth, no one else has come forward, so that's going to be it. <laughs> Oops, this is 10 9, isn't it? 10 9, 23. Okay, I'm passing this around for everybody to sign. Jamie, thank you. Um, to hiring committee for town administrator Donna and Judy, we appointed them at the last meeting and they've decided they um, are overwhelmed with family issues and they're stepping down. So we have approached Tom McArdle, who many of you will, may know. He's the um, um, public works director in Montpelier, for the city of Montpelier. Former. F former. Is he retired now? Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Um, and he has agreed to serve if we will appoint him. If that's all right with everybody. Okay. Just quickly make a motion. Jordan, did you just make a motion? Sure. Jordan, Jordan yeah, just moved I, it. <laughs> Second. <laughs> all in favor? Aye. Okay, thanks. And so this is to remove Donna and Judy. 
Yeah. Yeah. And appoint Tom. And replace them yeah. with Tom. Uh, okay, public comment. Anybody want to speak about anything that's not on the agenda? Think, okay, maybe. I'll say something. Okay. Um, I, I was on the select board when we did those callous road and bridge standards. But over time, they have to get renewed and renewed. To my recollection, we don't have callous road and bridge standards. Subsequent select boards have adopted the state standards. And so you have to renew all the time. And even though back in 2015 and 2017, Conrad Smith, um, Stephanie really wrote this beautiful thing. And actually, it was, um, it was like the gold standard. And even the people in the state house were very impressed at AOT because they recognized that a one size fit all doesn't work. What is good in Williston or Essex might not fit the back roads in Callis. And so they're going to use ours as, you know, like a template. But um, I think every time you renew, if you don't keep your, our own little Callis Road and Bridge standards alive and approved. They and have to be renewed how often? Is I, think, I think every five years. And, I you think, think it's and so I think subsequent years. to that, yeah. you always come in and say, you guys need to sign the bridge standards. And I think we've adopted the state standards. Oh, and I think, I think there was some confusion so because I think that they did pass in their last session the new standards, which are definitely different from the state standards. Yeah, there's there's been there's been incremental readoption of them. There's a, the, been a lot of question whether or not they're they're being maintained to those standards, and that's a whole other conversation that I that I really don't want to get started tonight for right, sure. Right. But um, I'm, I'm but, they, but they are there, and and I was there for when they were readopted most recently, which was uh, at the end of last year, I believe. It was they, like September. Was our local road and bridge standards? It was our local road okay. and bridge standards. So those they were the they were re they were readopted as they were originally proposed. Now, yeah. you know, which we'll need to find an update because the one that's listed on the town website is 2015. Yeah, I, it's just in the minutes, I think. But I think they readopted that one. It, that was the one that they readopted. That's not the modified one. So we just need to change the date. It is right. the modified one. So it, it's the modified road standard, Callis Road Standard, um, that was initially implemented in 2015. Um, and then it had been incrementally readopted on a number of occasions, most recently in September of last year. Um, there at that time there was there was question of whether or not it needed to be uh, run back by the state. I mean, any any of those uh, modified road standards needs to be reviewed by by AOT anyway. Um, so there's some so there's some question on whether or not it'd be appropriate to have those reviewed again, uh, just to make sure that they're still in good standing or make any changes. But that was it was readopted nonetheless. Um, so, so you think that the callus. It, it was, I would, yeah, I was, I was there. It's in the minutes, I don't, it wasn't updated as a. Okay. I see All right, now we're gonna to turn to highway department issues. There's several here. Um, I've got three things. Toby's gonna to talk to us about the truck. Oh, well actually, let's hear whether you were able to get the 30%. We, we, we talked about, um, authorizing a purchase of a new truck at the last meeting. Um, but we put that off to now because Anne and some others thought that maybe we could get a grant that would pay for up to 30% of it. Um, I can fill you in on that. Oh, OK. So it's a clean diesel energy program. Um, it's actually not in place yet. It's an RFP that the state is going to do. The Department of Environmental Conservation is, is doing it. Um, I called them today. The, the vehicle that you're replacing has to be a 2009 or earlier because they're trying to get all the smoky old diesels off the road. Mm. So we don't qualify for our truck because the truck that we're replacing is a 2014. Um, however, when we get to purchasing a grader, um, our grader will actually qualify for up to a 25% um, grant. Um, in the purchase of a new grader. Um, so the last time we um, 
looked at trading in the grade, the old one of the old graders for a new one, the trading value was about thirty thousand um, dollars. The grant program is twenty-five percent, which would be seventy-five thousand dollars, twenty-five percent of three hundred thousand. So that would be a good program if, if and when we do decide to go for a new grader, uh, and if that program does take off. Um, the only uh, codicil about that program is the old grader has to disappear. It has to be dissembled and never be run again. In other words, they have to be certain that that old diesel engine is not being used any longer. So how can we get thirty percent? How can we get a trade in if we take it apart? Well, there, there's, I'm just saying we could trade it in and not qualify for this program for thirty thousand, oh, or, right. or we can or we can, just, we can apply for the grant, but that means we have to dissemble. Yeah. We have to get the, the we have to prove within sixty days of purchase that we've taken that grader and made it un unusable ever again. That's the codicil about that. So essentially right now, for the new 10-wheel truck, there's no grant monies other than just going ahead and ordering it and doing a trade-in. And so essentially, if you're still on the board for that, then we should just authorize the road crew to start on negotiating. Remind that. us how that would work. When would we start paying for it? So I talked with the um, salesman on, on uh, Charlie Voice today. Um, it's going to be well over a year before we see the truck. So if we ordered it tomorrow, it would be a year from t tomorrow, and probably a year and six months. So, and if we take out a lease purchase on it, uh, it would be another year after that before you'd have to make any payments. So you're talking almost two and a half years away before it actually has to go on to a, uh, the capital plan or your, or your budget. And is there another 10-wheeler that can, or not 10-wheeler, I'm sorry, um, another six-wheeler that can serve the function of that? I guess, the, the, are, well, the, is, are they, are they going to be able to sustain waiting for that, or do we Well, need no, the old truck is still there. Oh, okay. So, in other words, the old truck, which is seven years old and then essentially has expired its extended warranty, is still mm. on the road, still working. Um, we just got it back from some repairs that it needed. But again, um, we have been working on um, doing a seven-year replacement policy yeah. in order to um, keep the extended warranty. Um, that's something we can, so essentially now we're doing a test where, okay, if we make another year and a half without a problem, maybe we can change that. And when you get to doing the capital planning, I, you know, I sort of did a draft of a capital plan. What you really want to do is not stack five or six payments right. in one year. You want to sort of stagger them as much as you can. And that's a manipulative tool that we can use in the future. You can change the plan. You can um, trade a truck in earlier so that you then are not stacking them all up in the same year. Um, so that's something, that's a tool that you guys can do at any time. It's, um, the reality is that we have over $2 million worth of rolling stock in the town garage. And on a 10-year plan, that's $200,000 a year you have to put aside as capital monies to maintain it. Mm -hmm. um, so that's the, you know, that would be the target right now. <coughs> probably three years, we've had over 100000 in the capital plan. And that's because a lot of things were not, it were paid off and essentially didn't, didn't require it. And one, one of the last years that I worked on the capital plan, they actually put like 30000 in that wasn't a part of a payment. It was just to get to 100000 mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Um, it's just that now um, things cost a lot more for a replacement. So, you know, the number is close to two, two million, over two million for replacement costs. And again, if you, so right now, we're doing a lot of five years, so you guys can essentially just go, okay, that's five years, we can just go ahead and do it. If you want to extend those so you have less payments over more years, you can go to town meeting every year and have town voters approve that so that then you can balance those payments by how you approach purchasing a truck. Because um, we'll, you know, right now, a grader would be a 10-year purchase and it's, instead of five years and it cuts the payment in half, yeah. but it extends it for more years. So there's all those tools in your in your tool bag for the capital plan. And we'll be discussing that in early November when you yeah. come yeah. with the capital plan. So all he's asking for tonight is it's authorization to approve to go purchase, go purchase it. Mm -hmm. Any questions? 
Okay. Would somebody like to move purchasing <coughs> the truck? I mean, authorizing Toby to order the truck. Pardon me. It's so moved. Okay. Do we have a second? A second. And we have a second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, Rose, you got that? No? Um, can you give me a little bit more details about it is a 2024 10-wheeler Western Star? It's probably going to be a 25. But 2025 Western, Western Star 10-wheeler. 10-wheeler. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. All right, now you're going to try to talk us into purchasing a boom mower again. Well, you, um, <laughs> so the opportunity came up. Tegan actually forwarded me a, an email that she got from Pete's Equipment. Uh, Pete's Equipment is the, is the firm that we're renting the mower currently from. Um, and they have a fall sale uh, for a brand new Massey Ferguson for $144,000 or a used one for $132,000. And it's actually the mower that we're using right now, but we rented from Pete's. Okay. Just throw it out there for you. And you, um, Ann asked me to sort of compare the cost of renting it every year versus owning. It's about, well, it's $3,500 a week if you rent it. Um, eight weeks is going to be $28,000 a year. And that's if we don't need it six weeks or whatever. I still don't know um, if we went out every day how, how many weeks it would take to do one pass of all the roads. I'm trying to track that now with our using this thing. So um, the payment, if you bought it on a five-year loan, it would be 28,000 per year for five years. And at the end of five years, there'd be no more 28,000 per year. And is it revenue. under warranty for the five years? I'm not sure what the warranty on the machinery is. Mm -hmm. it, it's no, there's no extended warranty. So uh, it would be whatever the manufacturer warranty is, probably for just a year. So there's no extra charge for an extended warranty. Just wanted to let you know that that opportunity is there. I called them this morning, and both, both um, mowers are still available. Wow. Um, so. And again, there's no rush except unless somebody else decides they want them and they're not there in two weeks or a month or whatever. So you can have some discussion about it. Do we still have, <clears throat> do we still have the one that we're renting? Or, yeah, Yeah, it just, it just arrived on the third. Okay. If you guys want to go take a look at it. It's a nice piece. I talked with Dana today, who's been mowing with it. it. says it's great. You just turn the key and go. No problems. Everything works. Does a great job. Um, we only had one guy swing a hammer at him saying, don't mow my grass. <laughs> um, so. <laughs> And this is the same situation as the last one we talked about, where it's a, a fixed boom, so there's yeah, not... Yeah, it's, it's a boom mower. There's right. not alternate uses of that. Right, there's no, yeah, there's no multi-use mowing equipment. <clears throat> I mean, the only other thing is to find an outside contractor, but again, um, we, we were gonna look at so, you know, an outside contractor and see if they, what they would charge to do the whole town, but nobody's uh, followed up on that. Is there any chance of discussion with, I mean, I guess if you need it eight weeks, that's most of the summer. I'm just thinking of, you know, a relationship with another town or the chance of renting it to another town for a month when we're not using it. Um, I haven't looked at that. So East Montpelier has its own, so that's not going to happen. I don't know that Worcester has one. I have to if I could pause it, I, I guess renting equipment is always a basic proposition. Yeah. Um, in your respect to things that you pay for. Hey. <laughs> right. uh, but um, yeah, so I, I uh, you know, I think the big the big question is um, how much how much road mowing is there to do, what kind of style, and like how long does it take? And if it's taking eight weeks out of the year to do the road mowing twice, and then I think that that influences the math. 
you know. Um, that uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm tracking it right now with you yeah. just to see, you know, how far we get and what we didn't get. Um, it really makes a big difference. So as these things grow up on the side of the road, um, somebody may pull over thinking that it's just grass there and it's a ditch because we haven't mowed it. Yeah, and yeah. There's a lot of safety issues on intersections where you can't see around the tall grass. It's really something that has to happen, and that's the only tool. And I guess the question is, how do you how do you do it? I mean, you can hire a contractor, you can rent equipment, or you can buy a piece of equipment, mm -hmm. and then you just look at the. Then it's a cost to benefit ratio. Um, we haven't done the costing on uh, a contractor. You know, if you could call a contractor and say 69 miles of mowing or 72 miles of roadside mowing, give me a ballpark figure what it's going to cost every year. It's probably going to be more than $28,000 twice a year. Yeah, and, and I, I can say I've made uh, two of those phone calls, and you can't, even, you can't even start the conversation unless you can quantify what kind of road mowing and what kind of equipment they need. Uh, you know, otherwise, they're just going to take a conservative guess on what their costs are going to be and say, that, you know, worst case scenario, I'm going to need all of my equipment for right. all 90 miles of your roads. And, and, and that's not really a, a fruitful conversation either. You know, I think. I'd be really interested in seeing kind of what, what kind of mileage uh, he's getting out, like what kind of productivity he's getting out of the right. machine uh, over October through the rental period. And then you right. know, looking at what, what we can do to maximize our value out of the, the yeah. mower by you know, assigning it and, certain and, mowing tasks, but not others, et cetera, et cetera. And again, part of the problem was the old, the old tractor that we had was very hard to quantify because half the time it broke down. So there was no consistency about, OK, I went out mowing with my job, but I, I, I got an hour in and then it busted. So right. at this point, we will we'll really get it. You know, we'll get it within the next three weeks, we'll get a full idea of how much we got done. And again, it's just three weeks. So I think we'll need four. Um, that's, my, that's my estimate. Right. Um, so I'll report back to you. And if, the, if the other mowers are still available, and that's a good choice for you guys, then we can still move ahead. Did you say other mowers plural? I thought there was oh, one. Well, there's, there's two. There's well, there's a new one. one for 144 and a used one for Oh, I thought the one we're using is the one that would turn out to be the used one. I don't know if it's the same one, but oh, it's okay. the same model. It's the exact same equipment. They have five or six or eight or nine of them that they rent out. Okay, I see. So it's the same model, not, the, not necessarily the one we have. Okay. So in two weeks, we'll hear from you again. Yeah, I'll give numbers. you an update on how, how many models we got. Yeah, Toby, what was the price on the used one? Well, 132. And is the new price, you said it was a sale price? No, no it's, that's it's the regular a brand new price. 144. Okay. I guess it's an end of the year. I don't know what they're doing. Maybe they're buying a whole it's bunch of new ones for the sale. next year. I mean, the last ones we looked at were 185 and 192. So it's a, it's a 50 to $60,000 reduction in the initial cost. I think that New Holland I saw in Middlebury it was 160 or something like that. But it was a year old tractor and a brand new mower. And they're mixing and matching in ways to try to get the price down. Okay. Anyways, it seems like a good price. And there's a used one for 10,000, a little, you know, 8,000 less. All right, good. Thanks, we'll go yeah. come back to it next week. Thanks. And then finally, this is the scoping study. Are we signing because it's a grant? Yeah. Like the a, last one? Okay. Um, it's a contract that is under a grant. So we do have a, a grant, and that's the contract with uh, Du Bois and King that's signed between um, Central Vermont Regional Planning, who is, mod who is running the grant. Yeah, and we're the town, so we have to sign it. To, to sign it uh, to let them give us the money to do the Kent Hill study. No, sign study. it so that the country, so that Dubois and Kent can start the work. Oh, okay. There's no money exchanged right now until all the bills come due. And that's a, a roughly a thirty-nine thousand dollar grant. I think the town's share of that is ten thousand dollars. So that's be, right. It's coming. Essentially, out. we'll pay ten or eleven thousand when all when all the work is done. It's not done till the end of twenty four or early twenty five. So it just needs uh, a signature. Would you like an explanation of what that is? No, I heard somebody say something. Just okay. I just said no. It's only a scope. Oh, okay. It's just a scope is done. Yeah. Well, not only that, we had to get a grant first to get the information so we could do the scoping 
study. <laughs> okay, would somebody like to move this and authorize somebody to sign it? One hundred can sign it on behalf of the uh, the board. Move that we authorize and to sign. <laughs> sure. I wasn't going to authorize myself. And I've moved everything else. So. Uh, do I have a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, thanks. Toby, thank you, sure. and get better. If you give me a copy of that, I'll get that set. Oh, okay, then I'd better finish it. Okay. Next up is the budget, so we'll... <coughs> The date uh, September uh, October. I keep wanting to look at nine twenty twenty three. There you go. Okay. Thanks for coming out twice tonight, Toby. Uh. Okay. So, as you all know, we're working on the budget, and we've asked several of you who have pieces of the budget to come in and give us your wish lists. So we'll start with Tegan. Um, as far as the assistant clerk, uh, two things. One is that everyone got a raise this year. Mine was built into the budget. The road crew got theirs. The listers got theirs. Barbara did not make any additional money. She still has the same hourly wage she did last year. Um, and I don't know if you're planning on doing a cost of living this year, but if you're not, if we're waiting until next July to pay her more money, then I recommend we increase her wages by 10%. That should cover two years of cost of living. Um, Personally, I think she has held this group of us together with duct tape and glue and cheerfulness for the last six months, and I don't know where we'd be without her. So we should recognize her in some really meaningful way. Um, I know budgeting is tight, and I know we can't just like give her piles of money much as we would love to, but I do think we should show her the respect she deserves and give her a decent increase. Did you give us, so you wrote that in here? I included a 10% increase. You know, I just realized that Gabrielle was the one who was gonna keep these notes so that we could put this into the draft budget. Could somebody do that so that it can be sent to Sandra tomorrow? Because we're gonna work on her draft budget and she's gonna include these into the budget. Yes? As people have, have submitted their budget requests to the select board, I have been forwarding them to Sandra. The requ oh, you have? Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you. E e okay. And hers is written, Tegan's is written down. Let me just make sure that's clear. So you're suggesting cost of increase for the town clerk. Uh, and I see you've put in a number for the town clerk, uh, the assistant town clerk. And at the bottom, I said I calculated uh, a 10% increase on her hourly wage, which brings her up to 2679 an hour. Oh, yes, I see. Times 25 hours a week times 52 weeks. I don't know if you all worked out a different number of hours per week. For her position, I know you were trying to figure that out more specifically, but I, if I recall correctly, that was the number you... Yeah, the, we'll, we'll, we probably will just have a conversation with Barbara about it at some point. Okay, and, but I wanted to have a number. Um, I appreciate it. As far as land record books, as far as I know the pricing for that, those supplies are not changing, so that, I'm not changing that. Uh, the digitizing we've been doing, it goes back to 1943. Mm -hmm. Uh, I feel like the next couple of years is not the time to be digitizing farther back. We've got a lot of other financial things on our plate, and I'm not asking for any money to do big projects. We do digitize everything as it comes in, so everything new is being digitized. That doesn't require any additional assistance. I just do that. Mm -hmm. um, and then the vault shell, we had a different fund for that to come from. I don't know. I, it wasn't on the old the last two year or two's budget, and I didn't know if that's because it's coming from the fund that we created, or if it's because Jeremy just didn't spend anything. I wasn't clear on that. So let's make a note to ask. Because I know from the, the income I make doing my, my reporting, a chunk of it from every reporting goes toward the fund that's designed to take care of the vault. Um, and I assume that, I, I wasn't sure if that needed to be budgeted since it's just coming from a, a fund that's already existed. 
So that's a question for Sandra. Are you noting that by any chance? Can, can you make yeah. sure that um, if that gets to Sandra when, yeah. when Barbara forwards this? Okay, thanks. And why do we do vault shelving every year? You mean we, we buy new shelves every year? I don't know, and I'm not sure. I know some years we do big projects to rearrange things. Space gets tight, and you need to do different containers or different varieties of shelving. East Montpelier actually has some really cool systems. Um, because there's lots of things I keep having to put in that never come out. And at some point, we are going to need to get more creative, and I'm going to need to do some projects so that we can fit more things in there. Well, doesn't digitizing enable you to, I don't know, put them in deep storage somewhere? Like where? Um, <laughs> I don't know. They need to be in the vault, and Vermont says they need to be on paper. Oh. Everything needs to be on paper and digital. So we're just going to have to keep building bigger vaults forever? We just have to keep building bigger vaults unless it's <laughs> 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 But well not <laughs> and ours is a pretty good size. Like, if you use some of the techniques East Montpelier is using, we could fit a lot more in there. It's uh -huh. there are rolling shelves and there are hidden spots and there are things underneath things. It's just it takes some money to build those. Okay. All right. Thank you. <laughs> um, who's next? John, you've got three things. Lister's zoning administrator and town hall budget. Okay. You, have any of the you sent us some stuff. Everybody else is looking at theirs on the computer, and I have mine I right have here. Paper copies of the Lister shop. That'd be handy. Sure. Yeah, I don't recall seeing a Lister one. Well, I can't find mine now, so oh, is this it? I'll take one. Thanks. Oh yeah, that looks familiar. So it's pretty straightforward. I mean, they're all the same. No one's looking a couple of years down the road, but we got the uh, townwide reassessment coming up, and I was around in 2015 when we did our reappraisal, and it did involve lifter time beyond our regular, you know, late spring, just. Uh, following up on building permits and going out and inspecting. Um, so the uh, list of wages are up to reflect that. The mapping is about the same as it always was. I talked to Christine Chamberlain as our mapping, it may be less than that, but 37 will cover it. Mm -hmm. um, the thousand dollars for software is just the way it goes. We've got our portion of uh, what the listers use from Nimrick, we've got Cam and we've got Apex, a drawing thing, and these are subscriptions. It's actually less than last year that you've asked for. Yeah, but look at the, you go to the actual from the year before. Mm -hmm. it, uh -huh. and, and I'm hoping that if I get a, a better number, I can give it to you before you, you, know, and you just put it in that mm -hmm. column. Okay. Um, lister expenses. 150 bucks is pretty much just for certified mailings. That's all it is at this point. Because you won't be driving around the town next year? Well, we will be, but I mean, that's part of the wages. That's part of the hourly. Oh, we don't give you a, a road per... Uh, no. A, 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 oops. Mileage. <laughs> Mileage, thank you. Yeah. So that's pretty much it. I, I'm, I'm comfortable with the 18850 cover. In March of 2025, you may want to start thinking oh, right. about putting yeah. an assessor, a professional assessor, in place and finding a budget for it. <clears throat> now, obviously, it's only one quarter of the fiscal year, so March of 2025, and then in your fiscal 26 budget, you're going to have to definitely have somebody there. Because the way we've talked about it in the past, the requirements of the list of work uh, the computerization that they are doing um, is pretty intense. And I don't know whether or not you will find somebody in town willing to do this. So you're saying we would not have three listers next year, we would have one professional assessor? You can negotiate. You can do one professional part-time with one lister from the town. You can 
It depends how you want to arrange it, but they're whatever the contract is. But for sure, if you have a professional assessor that's IAAO, whatever, uh, credential, you're going to be paying a little bit um, for that. So John and I have talked about it. Yeah. <laughs> and how much would a professional assessor cost? Well, <clears throat> full time. We wouldn't need a full time one. I would say part time, 25000 Would their services need to be supplemented with somebody locally to, to do the mapping type components or any kind of like incremental that work? Or? It's a good question. I think it would be up to uh, who you hire and what they include in it, if they include the mapping or not. Um, Maintaining the parcel map is a list of responsibility. Yeah. So would that replace the 18850? Instead, we would, is, is that what you're proposing? That instead we put the 25,000 in the budget? I know that I, I, was, I met with the other two listeners that we're not going to walk out of the mass in the next year. We're going to be around for a little while, but it's inevitable. Okay. What well, Jan had suggested we put it in the 25 budget. That's why I'm. I was thinking about it. I, I, oh. Because March March of 2025 is when you hire or bring in new listers if you're going to, what if you don't get it? So I'm just saying, thinking ahead, yeah. uh, you might want to start interviewing and seeing how much. And, and what quarter, you know, you're only looking at one quarter, March to July, or June, and one quarter of that 2025 budget, it might only be 10 grand, or it might even be less. I mean, I don't know. And then, and then in your fiscal 26 is when you would have a full loan assessor. I just, it, in terms of planning, long range planning, it would be good to just at least consider that and maybe put a little extra in the budget in case. And also at that time, March of 2025, reappraisal is going to be going on. So uh, there might be extra work with the listers. make this more confusing than it is, but uh, an assessor might expect their own office. <laughs> Will you build them one? <laughs> <laughs> right now we have a corner in the town office. Yeah, I see. So the assessor would actually be our employee. It wouldn't be a contractor. It depends how many hours you give them. My understanding that if it's under 32 or something that's not really an employee with full-blown benefits and all that. You might and, and, no, I was envisioning that there are firms that have people who do this for you as a service. That's not how you... Well, there, I mean, you go out and get an assessor. It doesn't necessarily mean that, that they uh, know how to maintain the grand list. They might be, do a great job in determining the value, of, the assessed value of a piece of property, but you've got maintaining the grand list, you've got maintaining the parcel maps. There, there's, there's other stuff. Um, that's unrelated to assessing the value of property. We, we are the state's bookkeepers. I know that's what the listers have come down to. Half of what we do is manage data for the state. If, and the state's not actually happy with the way we're doing it, so now they're requiring all listers to have a certain amount of annual training and certificates. And without, that, without a certificate, even if you're elected, you can't function as a lister as a, a house bill that passed a year ago. So we, we are the state's bookkeepers. Um, I'm just thinking, thinking through kind of the, the workload and the expertise. If, <clears throat> if a professional assessor, even if it were contracted out, if, if they were, um, you know, contracted for just the assessment and appraisal, um, does that significantly shift the workload for the listers so that there's more cushion to, to do the, the data entry and the map, map work? Sure, sure. You could divide the responsibilities that way. So assessing the value of the property would be different than the, actually the other bookkeeping things, tasks the listers do. I think it would 
Are you applying for the job? No. <laughs> yeah. My, my observation is that in addition to all the very technical, huge amount of very technical work that listeners do, they interact with the public a lot. They interact with the public a lot. Right. So so that is good good communication with the treasurer. Mm -hmm. Yes. And the town, the town, park, the town office. Yeah. That's another thing I noticed. We get a lot of phone calls and emails for the listers, and they're just, they're only in there a few times a week. And so it's always playing phone tag and email tag with them when they're there, when they're available. That, like, having someone in the office on set hours would be helpful in that respect. Okay. Is there a reason why the listers have to work in the office? Couldn't they work remotely? Uh, I mean, it, and they could take the calls and forward it to them? It used to be we needed access to the vault, but now many of the deeds are digitized, and as are the, uh, the, the surveys. That are. And there could be a time when the listers wouldn't have to work in the town office. You could work here, for example, come in during the day and work here or something. Well, now that we got a decent internet. A lot of the NIMRIC software could be moved to the cloud. Also, that is an option we haven't talked about yet since the internet is still new. Um, and if it's on the cloud, it's a different different situation. Mm -hmm. That's true. <laughs> My very lay understanding is that there's three dis listers because that's largely relative to like the kind of boots on the ground uh, element of going around and assessing the, the parcels, right? Um, so it's based on town population, is it? No, I'm not sure about that. I think it's a statute. That there, that there are three of them? Or that? Oh, really? Yeah. Huh. Except unless they, unless they hire some professional. And that would differ. But if you don't have a, you know, an assessor hired, it's, it's usually three listers. Yeah. Hmm. At least Montpelier's three, Worcester's three, Woodbury's three. Okay, well, it sounds like anyway, something point. for us to put on our list. Yeah. Um, how about town hall? Um, for the zoning administrator? Uh, there really is no zoning administrator budget. The zoning administrator is part of the DRB budget. I thought DRB was listed under zoning. But, it, but anyway, but there are pieces that are yours, like your stipend and expenses. Stipend and expenses. Expenses are certified mailing, and I think I asked for 600 bucks because mm -hmm. it is getting more and more expensive, and uh, there are more and more conditional use applications being sent out and reviewed. Okay. But I think he needs to get paid more. Okay, make your case. Well, the case that I would make, see, so John is, he, he, he cuts himself short. A zoning administrator, the way we have it written is that people should go to the zoning administrator even before they apply for a permit. So people call him and he has to talk to them and he has to say, oh, you know, if you're doing this and this and this, but maybe Ben's better you know. So, so there's all of that which is before the permit comes into place and then the permit comes into the application and then not only that, he has to look at the maps, the setbacks, is it in flood zone? <laughs> Flood hazard is it in shoreland, and now we got people are in both, which have a lot of things. And now, um, after all of that application, either he has to help prepare for the DRB, or um, after it's all done, he has to drive and put up the key. He didn't get mileage. He did those, and so there's a lot of. I mean, I'm. Yeah, well, anyway, I just think 
So Tegan and I, Tegan went out and asked, did the other towns have an assistant zoning administrator like I am, supposedly? And no other town does. <laughs> no, but they also don't have hourly zoning administrators. Right. Like they have salary zoning administrators, and some of them were pretty well paid. And so, um, and you asked about population as well. So that we, could, we did ask, yeah, we had equal time, I mean, equal kind of things. So, all of them were salaried at a pretty higher rate. I think we were 30 bucks an hour, maybe. I don't know. We even figured the hour. I don't remember now. Okay. But anyway, so, <coughs> 3,800 is really low pay. And I think John deserves more. Any any zoning administrator that's going to be in this position. Sorry, what what's he getting now? Forty eight. Forty eight. Thank you. Yeah, the stipend. I would at least put it up to seventy five hundred. Okay. Uh, how many? Do you have any estimate of how many hours a week you, or whatever it is you need to do work? I mean, most, I most mean, applications are easy, and others. No, no, counting all the putting up the peas and things like that. Putting up the peas is horrible. <laughs> Why is that horrible? <laughs> because you have to get it done within a certain period of time for it to work. And so when, when it's the last thing in the world you want to do is get a grape stake, put a piece of plywood on it, staple the pea, and then drive all the way to you know, some corner of town to hammer the thing in the ground. Uh, make your assistant do it. <laughs> and then people remove the peas and then put them back and put the peas back. I do, when I recognize a pea that's past its expiration date, I take it so I don't have to rebuild the, yeah. the signpost. <laughs> <laughs> but, but seriously, when you count all that, the stuff that Jan was talking about, how many hours a week, do you get, are you able to make an estimate? You know, I, I, I don't keep track, and I'm not even aware of getting paid. I, I, I really, yeah, I'm not doing it for the money. Uh, can you keep track of the time that you spend on it? No, no, no. I, I'm, I'm not surprised. I just wondered if he could. Yeah, yeah. He's hard to look at payroll. He does turn in hours, but right? he does turn. I mean, Donna turns in his hours, and she's the one calculating. <laughs> somebody to at least be interested in what John does. And we're not going to get anybody interested to do what John does, uh, you know, for, for nothing. It's, it's, really, it's a really hard thing to ask. Um, we're spoiled because John knows all of the codes and the ordinances and <laughs> sits on the planning commission and all of the other things. But, you know, we need to Mileage is a good example. As a town, we need to be, if it's our policy to pay people for mileage, then we need to pay people for mileage. And it's everybody's responsibility to make sure that they're, that they're turning in that mileage for, at the, for, for the very least, we need to be knowing how much that actually costs. So because when we go and ask somebody else to do it, if they're gonna be interested in taking over a position, we need to be able to say, this is the mileage and these are the hours and this is how much Is it costs. the personnel policy committee working on that? Yeah. Okay, great. Mileage is a big thing. It's in yeah, there good. for sure. Yeah. Good, good, so. good. And as an assistant, I don't feel like I need to get paid. I mean, seriously, I don't. I mean, he, he, all he wants is a sounding board and somebody else to talk to. And we spend some time on the phone. Sometimes we spend a lot of time on the email. I can't calculate. How I, I feel she asked me for my hours. I can't give her an hour. I didn't give her any hours this month, even though I know I did some work. But I, I, I can't keep track of it. So I don't know what to do for that. I really don't. But I do think there should, like you said, the zoning person in training, and it should be somebody younger than me. <laughs> you so, so, so are you suggesting <laughs> we, we not put anything in for a stipend for an assistant? I, I think I said, you're supposed to get 200. Well, yeah, we used to. I said 500 a year for a stipend, but that was just me being, I, I think that was in my email. Yeah. I suggested John didn't have it. <laughs> so I, I could, you know, for whatever, just, that was just that. But I would up his, take my salary out, put it into his, oh, okay. give me 500, and then whatever his expenses that he says that they've got, whatever he wants, go with that. That was just my suggestion. Barbara, you had your hand raised. 
Oh, when we were talking about hours, I was saying we can tell from payroll how many hours a month he works. But that's for his Lister things. Jim put it out to me. We don't track his hours for zoning. He gets assigned. Oh, gotcha. <clears throat> Anything else, um, zoning administrator? Yes. I, I noticed that in my whole budget, the uh, DRD secretary was in that category that okay, we'll continue to set aside money for the DRD secretary. We don't have one at the moment. Oh, I can That's report sure. that um, Ryan requested that we leave that amount in, but we talked about it, not earmarking it for secretary. Um, I know when I was doing the DRB, I would have liked to have had a legal budget so I didn't have to go to the select board every time I wanted to talk to the uh, lawyer. So we talked about putting it in as a general expense if for the DRB. Yeah. Um, okay, can we move on to town hall? Uh, I think you got something from Donna. Yes. Okay. I got him with that. And I can't find it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I can't find mine. Thank you. John, has Sandra say, say gotten this? It's in the Sam. board folder. It is? Yes. Okay. All right. I didn't know what it was passing out. Okay. This is the town, this is the proposed, oh, I found mine. Would you like one? No, I just want to make sure that, that Anybody? this was new, that no. we get it to Sandra. But if it's in the oh, whole no, process, no, no, no. yeah. you. Okay. So when I was asked what I saw this building needing, uh, pretty much it was about things in the short run. I haven't thought about this building three years down the road. But uh, there are some things that should happen sooner rather than later. Um, uh, the generator should be moved for the recommendation of the Design Advisory Board. And, and the Design Advisory Board also asked that the, the generator and the propane tank could be screened. Um, that, that's what they prefer. So I actually have a, the budget number here come, that came from uh, who are the people, Brookfield Service, removing the generator. And then I threw some money in there for lilacs. Seems like an appropriate shrub to screen things. Um, then just miscellaneous stuff, fixing that door so it doesn't stick, try to get it before it, it breaks all together. Uh, there's a storm window that was made but never installed by the, the guy that did our storm windows here. Goes on the gable end, should be installed. Um, the metal handrails, Scott and I were talking about that. Andy and I were talking about that. It might be too late in the year to do it, but next spring, sand them off and put a couple of coats of rust oil on them. Um, the exterior porch lights, that's one of the reasons that these doors get covered with the, the bugs and spiders. So take a shot at putting one of those yellow filament bulbs in so it lights up the place, but it might keep the moths away. Um, then that street light that's out there, apparently it's it belongs to Washington Electric. It doesn't get power from our meter. So I called them once and asked them, could we do something to get something that had a, a sharper cutoff? Because that's also casting so much light on the building that's attracting the critters. And, and also, you can see it driving down the street. It, there's no reason for it to do anything more than illuminate the parking lot and the path to the, to the doors. Um, so that needs more looking at. Um, but it may be that if Washington Electric says they can't change it, but they'd let us, they could take it down and we put our own lamp on that with a shade or something, it would have to get its power from our meter. And I don't know exactly how that's done, but that, that's one of the options. My understanding was that any of those that are before the meter, you're still paying like a, a monthly Fee. Even if it's before the meter, mm -hmm. they, they must figure out. I mean, it's like a flat fee, it's just like you, it, we own it, but. Yeah. I'd like to get it. Bill Powell, I think he's still working for that. <laughs> yeah. Have him come and look at it, and maybe he can talk to someone there, because who I spoke to wasn't really interested in, uh, in any kind of sharp cutoff fixture. But uh, I think it would be a nice thing to do for the building. 
Oh, and then uh, if in the future we're actually thinking of building office spaces in the town office, there probably won't be room for that big chair or table. And bringing it here would be the thing to do. Maybe commissioning some smaller tables to flank it so it actually turned into sort of a U-shaped or C-shaped kind of select board thing. Um, I want to consider something like that. But then we'd have to have another table for the new town office, uh, the new space in the town office. Well, the I mean, I saw a drawing done by, I forget who the people yeah. were, but someone was hired. Yeah, knows that one. And it was, it was a little like three foot by four foot. Tables. That's all it was? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I missed that. But you should see the desk area they gave Barbara. The thumbprint? It's got a lift up. Yes. <laughs> 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 so you're going to put me on the light, actually. <laughs> yeah, Back in here. You oh. order. <laughs> so this, this is my little list of things that I could see happening to the building more and more in the short term than the long term. And what about um, putting the shutters up on upstairs? Are shutters are they're on. Oh, they're on. Oh, geez, I didn't even notice. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and it's not comprehensive. <laughs> no, it's not. It's the best I can do in 10 minutes before I left the house. <laughs> Any other thoughts about still improving the acoustics in here? Uh, the upholstered furniture made a big difference, and I think continuing along that line. Um, it's, it's just that we still have one com town committee commission that refuses to meet here because it's too hard to hear and understand. And like Friday night, it was really hard to understand. It was loud. Oh, that was tough. It was mm. really hard to understand. We had, what, maybe 30 people in this room, and it was hard to understand what people were saying. It was so echoey. And as a 36-year-old, I can confirm it was really hard to hear. Yeah. Um, I also, I listened to the ORCA video from the last meeting since I missed it, and there were definitely a few people in here. I I don't know what you said, um, because voices are low or quiet or what have you, so there is, that's an issue. Yeah, it definitely needs more acoustic work in here. Yes. So, John, what's the first thing you would do if we said, or next thing you well, would do? Well, we spoke about this a while ago. I, I, I mentioned that it was going to be an incremental thing. And if this was like, even though it's a, a big empty room, if this was like a living room in someone's house, there wouldn't be an acoustic problem because you'd have sofas and you'd have things on the wall. And, and uh, so we still have a lot of hard surfaces that are directly opposite each other in which the sound's just going to have a blast bouncing back and forth. So, continuing to put things on the wall, even if they have a glass that reflects sound, if it was tilted just a bit so it wasn't exactly, you know, in, in plane opposite, that all mitigates. Um, and, and I think we've done everything we can as far as reverberation from the floor to the ceiling between the furniture and the rugs, that's probably pretty good. So right now it's just side to side. So are you, you and Donna continuing to think about that? Yeah, um, I maybe put a, a line item in the budget for uh, mm -hmm. nothing fancy but frames. So, so when they're nice photos yeah. and just start start mounting photos. So, you know, people you want to remember, buildings you want to remember, things. Scott just brought in an 1858 Beers map you try to find a place to hang that, that'll help. Wow. So it's, that's my opinion, one thing after another. Um, but you didn't put that in the budget. No, I didn't. Like I said, the only thing that crossed my mind before I left was maybe a, an allowance for picture frames. So what, a couple of hundred dollars for that? <laughs> yeah, yeah, 250 bucks on Yeah. I, I would pause it, maybe holding off on the chair to table until we know what the full scope of our office needs are and, and think about some acoustic infrastructure. I, when I was very do, when doing a very kind of cursory pass of acoustic stuff, there are, are acoustic ceiling contraptions that are that aren't just like just carpeting that's hanging from the ceiling, but they're just they're kind of cubicle wood shape. They look like cherry. They might actually be cherry, and they were not terribly expensive, and so. You know, I, we can go round and round on people's aesthetics for certain things, but I think at some point we're probably going to need to address the ceiling, ceiling to floor 
relationship and and it seems like if we could put some stuff on the ceiling that could be a good you option. Can, you can get a 12 by 12 glue up, which is which would be great for this. Um, that has an embossed pattern that's, that looks a lot like a, a stamped tin ceiling, it's got mm -hmm. yeah, that kind of thing, so aesthetically it would be appropriate for, for an old building like this. And it is designed for acoustics. It, but it's, it's not like the stuff, it's not like a tectum or, or, a, or a track system with panels. So something like that would be nice. I could look into that. That's a pretty simple matter. Besides the labor, estimating the materials is easy. Well, maybe you want to continue to work on this a little bit then. Yeah, well, probably it. until I go to my great reward, I'll be working on this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a great reward of having it approved and uh, making sure all the work is done. I think in getting this, you know, as Jordan said, I think it's a kind of priority to get this to where it's a useful space for everyone. Yeah. So, yeah, Barbara. So, I'd like to recommend. I, I, I hope that we do follow through on that. I'd like to suggest that before anything was purchased or installed that we consult with friends of the Callis Town Hall because they are kind of a continuation of the renovation committee that John and Scott and David Sheets and others sat on for so long, okay. for years, bringing us to this point. And even David Sheets has approved different kinds of acoustic tiling that would meet his historic preservation standards. So we want to be sure we remember them before we do anything. Okay. I'm sure John would never let us <laughs> 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 no, no. <laughs> consulting with David Sheets. <laughs> yeah, Tegan. You probably want to boost the internet uh, and phone on the budget for the town hall as well. Uh, uh, oh, oh, you mean they're um, posted to the new rates? It's, yeah, I would put it up to 2500 or 3000 in a year. We're still waiting to see what we're going to get billed every month from CV Fiber, but I... And that's different from the town uh, office expenses? This is this would yes, be... Yes, we have different phone lines and internet here than we do over there. Okay, so we'll wait to hear from... Can you give us that when you get is it? Is it 358 a month? I think that was for, that was for two months. So I think the internet is around 180 a month, and then I'd have to double check the phones, and that depends if we're keeping with consolidated for phones or switching to CD fiber for phones. So that's okay. That's still kind of up in the air. Okay. So those will all be listed already. I don't. I guess my budget's there, but um, those will all be listed. And maybe you can help us update those when we when the time comes. Okay. Thanks. Anything else on this one? Okay. Thank you, John. I think you get through all yours. Um, and as I said, Ryan has already requested 400. Uh, swim committee. Hi. Hi, Daniel. Yeah, um, I'm Daniel, and I'm joined by Mark here. Um, so, a couple observations. You may know that I didn't submit anything. Um, the I guess all things being equal, I, I would have requested it's a continuation of the same fifteen hundred dollar appropriation, which may at one time have covered more than sort of quote unquote overhead, but at this point only really covers water testing, uh, portalette, and um, the the trash service. Basically, when we're able to run the swim program, um, basically fees cover all our personnel costs at this point. Um, but I also, you know, the, the ongoing bigger change relates to the docks, which is why Mark is here. Before I hand it over to him, just acknowledge the uh, wonderful effort he, he and Christella put into getting money for the the floating dock, aka the raft, um, secured. So that will be a reality next summer. But we're also looking at replacing the, the other dock, the main dock. And, and he's done some research. I'll leave it to him to sort of discuss that. Okay. So, you, so you're all good with, um, like, you know, the swim instructors and lifeguards and all that, you know? So, not good. I wouldn't say good. <laughs> <laughs> that's not the word I would use. Okay, but it's not uh, We have a lot of recruitment <laughs> problems. We have online recruitment problems. Right. I would place our chance.
chances of running the program next summer at like 30%. Um, so if anyone knows someone who wants to commit now to do two pretty serious trainings prior to uh, a $2,000 job next July, put them in touch, but it's a tall order. Um, we've put in some standards that we're comfortable with, that make, make us feel much more comfortable about who we're putting new swimmers into the hands of, but it makes recruitment a lot more challenging. So, uh, but, but in terms of the finances, if we were to run the program, the fees would cover that person's business here. The costs, yeah. Okay. Um, so, I'm the one that needs the money. Sorry. <laughs> so, I, I came on as the maintenance guy probably about 15 years ago. Um, it seemed like both the ramp and the dock were relatively new then. Um, but the um, so the raft died last year. It started to sink. Parts of it had come off and were hanging out from underneath with um, sharp screws sticking out of them. Mm -hmm. It was a, it's a good thing we got it out of there when we did. Um, we managed by taking some of the money out of the budget that Daniel had and running a GoFundMe campaign to come up with enough, enough money for a new raft. Um, as soon as Sandra gets us a check for the second half, I can go pick it up. So that's going to go in the water next spring. So we're going to have a really nice new 10 by 10 raft out there that's made of steel and composite decking. It'll outlast um, my efforts for sure. Um, the dock is, the dock was made out of wood, it was made out of pressure treated and sear decking. It's been getting worse over the years. I've replaced <coughs> deck boards that were rotted. I've reinforced the frame where it was rotted. Um, but this summer, I, it was just worse than ever. And when Curtis Pond flooded, the dock actually floated up. You know, it's, it's anchored on one end, but the whole thing floated up, kind of drifted off, ran aground, and one of the um, steel pipe legs broke where the, the, the pipe didn't break, but the wood where the bracket is attached to broke off because it was so rotten. So we retired that section um, and, were, and put the intersection back uh, just to get us through the rest of the year. Um, but I'm you know, since, you know, I've been, I, we haven't gotten any new equipment down there. It's, you know, the, the, getting the raft this summer was the first, like, new equipment that I've been a part of. The dock is even more expensive than that, and I'm very new to it also. So I'm feeling my way through this. So what I thought about was, well, there's different ways we could do it. Um, we've built a replacement for the old one, just like it was made out of pressure treated, cedar decking, um, volunteer labor. Um, I estimated that to be twelve to fifteen hundred dollars for the materials and then the volunteer labor is free. The second option is to buy from dock doctors, which seems to be the place where all the cool people get their dock stuff. Like I don't know if anyone's familiar with um, over at the fishing access. The state has this really nice floating dock. Um, I was told that that cost twenty-five to thirty thousand dollars. The, the state purchased that from dock doctors. They buy all their floating docks for all their fishing accesses from dock doctors. Their stuff is really long-lasting. It's made in Ferrisburg. It's wicked expensive. Um, and I, I'm not going to bore you with it, but I, I wrote here that you know they offer different grades of docks for different kinds of water conditions. Um, we're not on an open island in Lake Champlain here. We don't need their heaviest duty. Um, yet their lightest duty one may be a little too light for, for our situation. I can attest to the fact that if anything down there is not super strong, the kids will break it. <laughs> They're great at it. They try all day long to break anything that's down there. So I focus on two middle options. We need a heavy duty aluminum and a light.
lighter duty steel. And so that's what I gave you guys um, numbers for here. And this is just off their website, tax included, and round and rounded up a little bit for um for tax increases. You can take 6% off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Why is the heavy duty one cheaper? That's great to know. Just steel. Aluminum. And that, but that, and that's a better dot? Because so, well, I would say that the steel, I don't know if the steel frame or the aluminum frame, the aluminum frame that I looked at is their heaviest duty aluminum frame. The uh, steel oh, frame is their, lo is their lower grade steel frame. I don't know exactly how they how they compare in terms of strength. Um, aluminum is really cool because it never rusts. Galvanized steel, you know, marine grade galvanized steel probably won't rust for a very long time, but aluminum will never rust. Mm -hmm. That might be one reason to consider aluminum over steel, plus it's a little bit cheaper. Um, but you'll, you'll notice I've also talked about the width issue. Our current dock is five feet wide. That's what they built it at. Hmm. Dock Dockers offers four and they offer six. So we've got to make, if we're going to go with that, we got, we've got to make a choice about whether to go a little bigger or a little narrow. How does the dock tend to get used? So the, the reason, I, I think, the reason the town buys and maintains this equipment is for the swim program. So looked at, oh. looked at from the viewpoint of the swim program, the swim instructors use the dock to observe the kids when they're swimming back and forth. The kids jump off the dock to um, when they're learning to dive. Um, that it may, maybe you have more to say about that, Daniel. But it's it's like it's kind of like a place to hang out for the instructors when they're observing the kids swimming and the place for the kids to hang out when they're getting ready to jump in the water. Um, outside of swim program hours, the dock is used by, for hanging out on by as many people as can fit on it, um, and for kids to do cannonballs and flips off the end of it. Um, I think a six-foot dock would be lovely. Everyone would love that because the way the trees are there, the dock is the sunniest place. So if you want, if it's if it's a little chilly, if there's a breeze, if you want to get if you want to get warm, everybody hangs out on the dock. So a wider dock would not. No one would mind that. It's just a question of cost. Does the dock we're talking about? It really is, I, I can't believe how expensive this stuff is. Yeah. Yeah, the dock does come in in the winter. Mark Mark has a team that removes it each year. I would echo that. I think skimping on the width would be a mistake. Um, okay. And I think these, I mean, these costs to me don't seem very high to think about them on an annualized basis, but I don't know what right. the town thinks about um, investing all the money up front. We have also this, we have some dialogue on by email this summer about this. We have an endowment fund, which um, I think is at $5,500. And five hundred dollars of that is all that's available for our discretionary use. Mm -hmm. Sandra and Barbara may correct me if I'm wrong, but that's my understanding. I think, though, for such a thing as this, maybe we could uh, ask for a small increase in our appropriations, sort of to annualize the cost and take some from that endowment mm -hmm. to repay over time. But I think that requires select board approval. But draw from the principle of that endowment. Is the 24 foot length, is that the current length? Mm -hmm. It is. Okay. Yep. So it would go out into the, and into the anything I've mentioned here is going to go out as far as the current one does. And I fully concur with the width that there's sometimes a lot of people on that dock and trying to sit in the sun yeah. and trying to walk around the people sitting in the sun Four feet would be challenging. Okay. I don't know if there would be, uh, and what I'm about to disclose might be proprietary technology, but uh, I just disassembled some family's dock. Uh, <laughs> and uh, they devised a pretty ingenious uh, construction of three, three aluminum C channels that are. 30 feet long each, and they're fairly light, and so every season two of us can 
assemble and disassemble in about two hours um, if we're not interrupted by toddlers and there's so the day 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 day. The <laughs> I mean, it's an all-day event for sure. Yeah, right. It's an all-day event. It takes us all day. Uh, but the only wood elements are are the pieces of decking, and, and we take them off in three sections. Mm -hmm. Sections, mm -hmm. right? So it's uh, I I know they didn't spend that much on it. <laughs> the the aluminum is is expensive, and I guess if we're interested in self building, I think there could be some right sizing. Uh, I, the Doc Doctor ones are great, but we might be able to do it for a little bit less, and I, I will try to disclose all of the proprietary design elements. Sure. Um, it, 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 I mean, like I said at the bottom, I don't, if any of you guys have any other ideas, I'd love to hear them. This is just what I came up with from talking to Mike and being down at the bottom. But, you know, getting away from the PT and minimizing the amount of wood replacement and that sort of thing, yeah. you know, and if it's you know, designed simplest, no, simply enough, then like mm -hmm. anything that needs work can just be kind of popped out and replaced. Um, but we do have to make sure our insurance will cover it, exactly. as we did with the right. That was the point I, that was the point I didn't get to. Right. Like the old, the old raft, right, was made by volunteers. Yeah. Um, the town's insurance, well, they had nothing to say about the, the whether at the, we weren't uh, in we, that insurance at right, the time. But when, we, but when we bought this new raft this summer, we made sure that Larry Smith signed off on it, um, and so that's a consideration with the new dock with a new dock as well, I'm imagining, is um, is Larry gonna be okay with us building our own NFC channels? Or right. I think Larry was pretty excited when he when I sent, you know, the page from the Doc Doctor's website that gave the construction details and the, the low rating and buoyancy factors. If he gets something like that for this new dock, he's probably gonna be really you know, the, I would yeah. imagine that he'd have an easier time signing off on it than something we And is it, is it floated? Uh, is the Doc Doctor's one is a floating one? Or no, he's talking about the rafts. Yeah. Yeah. Right, right. The, 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 raft, the raft we've already dealt with, the, you know, the, the floating mm -hmm. thing. This is the dock that sits on, on, on pipes. It's, it's in a, in a, it but the new one would sit on pipes, too. Yeah. The new one would sit on pipes. Yeah. That's something I mentioned here is that the one thing we can reuse is the pipes. Um, luckily, the dock doctor's dock sections take inch and a half pipes. That's what our old one took was inch and a half pipes, and they they'll probably last a hundred years. Like, there's nothing wrong with the galvanized pipes and the cast aluminum feet that they fit into. So, whatever we choose to do, I've intended to I intend to reuse the old pipes and feet because you know they're they're expensive if you buy them from dock doctors, but we we wouldn't need to because we could fit them right into their frames. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So that's anything else from you guys? I think we'll get Sandra to put that in, and then when we, that doesn't mean we're going to approve it. I mean, at some point we're going to go through the whole thing and figure well, out where we need to Absolutely. Just, but, you know, any, any, yeah. any further questions you know, we can even Yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll try to get you answers. Okay. And, and we're pretty confident that if we do the doc doctor's doc, it'll be passed if we'll approve it, I would think. I'm pretty sure. I imagine they're going to ask questions about how it's used. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I kind of went through this with the raft, but I'd be happy to do the same thing with Larry um, if he has questions about the dock. I can communicate with him. We're going to have to figure that out at some yeah. point. Yeah. Right. Okay. And if we are thinking about construction, at some point when you run into Steve, you should talk to him because he just did an enormous amount of research on docks, including looking at dock doctor ones to replace ours. So he would be a good person to brainstorm with. Okay. All right. Thank you. Okay, next up, Juanita, Cemetery Commission. I'm here, but you want to Well, you're still working on your budget, I gather. You're not, you, and, and your budget is kind of your own, because you have your own pot of money. Yes. Yes. The Cemetery Commission is unique in that we are elected. So we're our own separate entity. Um, and when I first was on the cemetery commission, the, 
budget was part of the, the whole town budget. But, you know, and, but a few years ago, I don't remember exactly when, uh, it was switched over so that it's an article every year at town meeting we come up with our budget and then it's voted on at town meeting. And we've tried to keep it the past few years at pretty much the same amount. Um, 49500 was what we've done the past couple of years. Um, and that includes um, sexting contract, mowing contract, trimming the hedge at uh, Fairview, supplies, and any special projects that we might you know, decide to work on. Um, right now, we're still working on the, the um, OS church fence. Um, where hopefully, that will be built before winter. And um, the Robinson uh, Cemetery fence is, well, it was done a year or so ago. And we were going to ask for volunteers to paint but it's been so bad that you know, Joe, our you know, sexton and maintenance person, he thought it was best that we would just wait. So mm -hmm. we will set a date sometime in the spring when things seem dried out, if they ever do, um, and have a volunteer day to pay the So you get income when people buy sites, is that right? That money goes into our endowment. Mm -hmm. So it, it's not really money we can use. Although we, um, I'm going to ask Rod Buck to come to our meeting um, at the end of the month. Rod is on the, uh, what, the board of? Trustee of Public Finance. Thank you, yes. Trustee of yes. Public Finance. Yes, thank you, thank And, uh, our target was $200,000 in the endowment, and once it got above that, Rod Youngs had said that, then you can think about taking money out. Well, it's quite a bit above that now. So we'll talk to him at our meeting about taking um, a percentage out of it, and that will mean our budget that we asked for from the town's people would be lower. What's the, uh, are, are there specific criteria for what the endowment is used for? We can just, you know, use it as part of our regular budget, um, or we can specify that we want it for a certain thing. Is, is it basically perpetual care? I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I was just comment on that. Um, years ago, um, the Cemetery Commission wasn't budgeting enough for their upkeep and fence repair and hedges and all that, and they kept drawing down that endowment, and it really was too low, and so Rod Buck, um, with his great advice, said, no more taking anything out, we need to build it up over 200000 and then you can, you know, take a little bit, um, but, because it is for perpetual care, people buy those plots, Okay. Oh, and I'm really sure. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the endowment is built up when people buy plots. Is that yeah, the endowment is? Yeah, and, and it's invested. invested. It's invested, and it's invested. Yeah. And the other projects tend to be paid for out of whatever for, the for town appropriates. Services. No. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, I was I was asking. Um, the town gives you money. Not for the endowment, but for the services that the uh, upkeep. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the uh, the way the endowment grows is when someone buys a plot, that money goes into the endowment, and it's it's invested and in, hopefully it'll continue to grow um, through the investments as well. Okay. But the, the amount that, that the town gives you doesn't go into the endowment. No. It's a separate. No, uh, that's, that's, that's the money that we spend on the upkeep. The uh, mowing contract, sexing contract, and whatever else might need doing. 
And do you need us to approve what you ask for, or do, do we just put uh, how it's the process? Yeah. No? Okay. Well, it sounds like we just need to represent it, <laughs> represent it in the, in the yeah. town plan, and it gets voted on right at the in town, the yeah. town yes. meeting. I've only been chair for a year. Yeah. <laughs> well, hey, I've been chair for less than a year, so yeah. you know, yes. I don't know what I'm doing I, yet. I've been on the commission for 10 years, <laughs> but I'm chair by default. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's, <laughs> and everyone else is new, or you know, only been there a couple of years, or yeah. new as in just been there one year. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so that, yeah, which is another reason I want. Uh, to see if Ron Buck can come to our meeting to explain how the endowment works to all of us. Give me a refresher and let everyone, all the other, the other four people know. Mm -hmm. Well, this is what it's for and this is how it works. And in the um, annual town report for this fiscal year that just ended in June, um, the town gave the Cemetery Commission 42.5 because they were able to get some money from their T. Rowe Price account, mm -hmm. 9,400. So 9,400 plus what we gave them um, equaled, mm -hmm. you know, what they needed. Okay. Yeah. okay. Any questions for uh, Juanita? Thanks for coming. Yeah. Sure. That was good to understand a little better how it works. And I think... Nick, yes. you want some money too. <laughs> well, there are two items. One is Vermont Emergency Management makes a general best practice recommendation to all the municipalities that they, uh, and some have done it, and some have not, um, set aside in a reserve fund, a one time reserve fund, uh, money that can be used in the midst of an emergency when some of the, uh, getting a, a service or materials that require um, a payment in the heat of the moment, when the select board may not be able to convene to, to officially approve the expenditure. So you have some money, and they, they're recommending $5,000 in, uh, in the reserve fund for that purpose. Um, so this is not a line item, this is just used if it's ever needed, which we hope it never is needed. Um, Who would have then, the authority to spend out of that fund? Uh, that's something to, to define. I'm guessing that it would be, I, I'm thinking, even thinking that one select board person plus somebody mm -hmm. under the emergency management director or somebody like that. Um, any, any combination of people that wouldn't require uh, any uh, official needs, which during an emergency can be very hard to do. about that uh... how about if we say um, we can't put a five thousand dollars in this year but maybe we could put a thousand in yeah. and then build it up over a few years that yeah. yeah okay and I'll just say that I, I know the budget is this exercise budget is difficult and a lot of hard decisions so I don't consider this an urgent request but just something that's to be prudent to do our time. So yeah, that's awesome. Well, it seems like we could certainly establish the fund, uh -huh. and even if we put a dollar in it, and just to get it you know, a holding place. So, yeah. yeah. Good. And the other is um, that the, the Cal's Emergency Management Group at their last meeting said it would be great to have a line item uh, for purchasing Food that can be stored, stored at a shelter, for instance, if it's usually canned food. So maybe $500 worth of uh, food that can be stored long term, has a long shelf life, and then eventually gets rotated out. Um, so that was a recommendation from that group, which I also consider to be not urgent. <laughs> it's not pressing, it's not near the top of the list, but it would be a good idea at some point. Yeah. Um, as a citizen, I'd like to recommend that the emergency management director get an annual stipend. Um, 
much like our constable gets a stipend, our animal control officer gets a stipend, our health officer gets a stipend. Um, and I was, had, had talked to Tegan about this even before our emergency management director was awarded the statewide mm -hmm. emergency management director of the year. I had told Tegan I thought that he should get an annual stipend or a monthly, or a monthly stipend, however it works out, but I feel like he should be recognized in that way. Mm -hmm. I, my view on that is that I think it's a great idea. Um, I would decline it, uh, but I think the next emergency management director maybe would be a good idea. So. I got it down. Okay. We'll talk about it at some point. We'll, we'll put it in and see where, where it goes. But thank you. Uh, questions for Nick? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I assume you've been keeping track of your hours. Obviously, it related to the FEMA response, but. Do you keep track of your hours at all relative to stuff outside that you were doing before uh, before it started raining in July? <laughs> no. no uh, it's all part of the blur. Yeah. I'm wondering if it's like a, a report at town town meeting on like hours hours dedicated in service type thing for for each of these for each of these positions. Not, not as, I mean, not just for the, for the event um, and to celebrate that, but you know, I think it's important for people. Oh, you people mean outside to, of the? Uh, I just, and just in uh, general, like how many hours are dedicated? We've had plenty of conversations with with Nick in, in, at least hours worth of conversations with you before it started raining uh, from yeah. the beginning of the year, and yeah. that's that's real time that people are committing to developing important. Policies yeah. and procedures and that sort of thing, and it would be a good year to recognize that. I think. You're. Um, do you write a, a town report for the? Yes. You do. Yes. So. That's that's three years. Ago. Yeah. yeah. Well, t speaking of that, uh, Tegan's. Um, are you going to have Mark use his journalism students to do the uh, story of the flood? So I have invited them to talk to me about it. He has two students. Uh, one is a Cal's resident, and one was a Cal's resident, but is not now. Uh, one is an editor, and one is just a journalist. But these are top quality kids. He wouldn't recommend things who are not top quality. So if it's all right with you all, um, I was going to give them a couple names of Nick, and some of you, and some other folks, and yeah get them to do a story on it. I thought that would be a really good way to engage them in our town report and our town meeting. Are these Callus kids that we're talking about? That's it. Oh, one is a Callus kid and one used to live here, does not at the moment, but they both know the town. I don't think we need to approve it, Tegan. I think you're the one who does the town report. I also wanted you to know that that was my good okay. plan for it. Love that idea. Yeah, I think that's terrific. So maybe they can gather some of this information about that. Jordan's talking about. Mm -hmm. All right. Um, thank you, Nick. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> um, I did say we were going to do more on looking at the budget from last time, but um, are we fried? <laughs> Pretty much. <laughs> That's safe to say. Yeah, I think I don't have any bandwidth left to think about budget right now. <laughs> Let's see if anybody's got any reports they want to make. I didn't put the full list in here because I knew we were going to be pretty tired by the time we got here. And by the way, Barbara and Scott put together some rec um, refreshments for us. Thank you. It got us through. And there's still cookies and donuts and Diet Coke. I want to know who thought of the Diet Coke. That was yeah. You know I'm an addict. Um, so, Ann, you have anything else on roads that we haven't already done today? I think we've done enough. Okay, roads today. Jamie, you probably have some stuff to say. I do. Um, <laughs> I assume at this point everybody knows about the bids. Maybe not. Um, the bid opening was what a week or two ago. I lose track of time. Um, the bids came in higher than we were hoping, fairly substantially so. Uh, we got two bids, and uh, it creates a funding gap 
Um, I'm in the process of scheduling and having a bunch of meetings um, between myself, Gabrielle will be at some, other CPA folks, um, and each of the contractors who bid to discuss uh, alterations that may uh, decrease the price tag. Um, so we're looking at ways to make it a little bit cheaper, and we're also looking at um, new creative uh, grant opportunities. The CPA is uh, in the process of um, early discussions with a, with a grant writer who we may um, hire to help us look into some grant funding opportunities. Um, so there's a lot of, lot of stuff going on, a lot of work being done, no, no major actions needed, just. Uh, so how can you fairly, do, we don't have to reopen the bids, but you can talk to them both separately? Yeah, so one of, the, one of the bidders approached us and said, I have some ideas. I'd love to talk about it if you're open to it. Mm -hmm. And so we met with Michael and decided the, the fair way to do that mm -hmm. would be to say, yes, we'd love to hear your ideas, and also reach out to the other bidder and say, we'd love to hear your ideas, too, okay. if you have ideas. Okay. If the ideas lead to a significant change in the design or scope of work that we thought other contractors might be interested in bidding because it's changed, we would want to put it back out to bid. Um, but if they're fairly minor things like mm -hmm. use a different type of rock anchor, um, then then it wouldn't need to go out to bid and it could we could offer that change to both of the bidders and get them each to rebid. Um, the other idea that's been bounced around that will come back to this board once we know more is there may be pieces of the project that they bid on that we could have the road crew do to save money on the project, hmm. right? So just as an example, and these are made up numbers, but if, you know, there, there'll be some type of a water control system, similar, it'll be a pipe, a pump or a siphon that's yet to be determined. But so there will be a large water pipe, similar to what was installed at the flood and it'll need to be put in a culvert and buried under a road to access construction. If the firm doing the construction says, that's gonna cost $10,000, mm -hmm. we could say, oh, does the road crew have a suitable culvert and a couple loads of gravel? Maybe we do that part ourselves mm -hmm. um, and save the money on the other end. So there will be, once we're in sort of contract negotiations. Once we've, once we've picked a firm and we're working on the contract, that's when we can have those conversations about can we do pieces of it? Can we save money here or there? Well, it sounds like you're, you're moving ahead. When You should have seen the looks on their faces when we opened those bids. I thought, oh, that's it, we're done. <laughs> it, 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 was, it was startling for sure, um, but but we're forging ahead and we're still optimistic and we're relaunching our fundraising efforts and um, I think we're still, you know, it's a, it's a heavy lift, but we're still on track to do it next year. Okay. Thank you. That's it. And Jordan, I left IT in because we, at the last meeting, we talked about a laptop. Um, for the new town administrator, whoever she or he may be. Yeah, uh, Tegan and I had a brief uh, conversation about it. I, I'm not terribly concerned about being able to get a machine that's adequate in short order. So I think as, as soon as we uh, have a kind of a, a timeline on a, on a start date, okay. we should we'll just go ahead and purchase one and it won't be like more for Tegan to pick one out or something like that if we need to. But. I figured we probably wouldn't go through every deck because we could probably get it cheaper and faster. Yeah. 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 
Okay. Yeah, and I, and I think they're fairly agnostic about where they come from, as long as it looks like it's being purchased responsibly, so. Okay. I think that's it. Am I missing anything? Anything else? Thank you all for Friday and for today. I know you've put in a lot of hours, extra hours this week, between the budgeting and the meet and greet and your early meeting, and I appreciate you all. Oh, thanks. Thanks. Ditto. Thank you. And thank you to Barbara and Scott for, for all the treats. It's the best dinner I've had. <laughs> and if you haven't had one of the donuts, you should. They're oh, absolutely, absolutely phenomenal. Yeah. All right. I de I'll declare this meeting adjourned. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.